Public education matters. Public education matters. Public education matters because every student matters. Public education matters. Public education matters because it is the foundation of our democracy. Public education matters because we are stronger when we speak in one voice. Public education matters. Public education matters. Public education matters. Public education matters. matters. This is Public Education Matters. Brought to you by the Ohio Education Association. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Public Education Matters. I'm your host, Katie Olmstead, and I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was an organization called the Ohio Education Association, and it represented nearly 120,000 public school teachers, education support professionals, higher ed faculty members, and others across the state of Ohio. Now, those education support professionals represent nine career families, ranging from food services to skilled trades. Nationwide, the average ESP has been working in their ESP field for 13 years. 81% of ESPs in the United States are women. Those are all interesting points, sure, but let's be honest. You were listening to all of this saying, so what? Throwing data at you and reciting lists and figures doesn't really enhance your understanding of ESP issues and challenges or the immense value of ESPs in our schools, does it? Our brains crave a narrative. It's how we make meaning of new information so we can interpret the world around us. And when our brains hear a good, powerful story, that can prompt us to act. That's why storytelling is such an important tool for organizing within a union. And that's what Ohio's new educators and aspiring educators heard all about at a recent joint conference, thanks to a session with AE advisor and associate professor of literacy and education at Ohio University Lancaster, Dr. Kevin Cordy, and one member ambassador and fifth grade social studies teacher in Huber Heights, Katie Fuller. We asked them to share some of that insight with us for this podcast, too. Kevin, Katie, thank you so much for joining us. It is so exciting to hear from you because you have so many powerful things to talk about. That's what story is, right? Let's talk with the the big, big question here. What is a story and what makes it powerful as that organizing tool? Well, that's a great question. Um, And people have been asking that for years. But if you think about story, it is a simple form just telling a narrative. It's telling a short account. But the way that you tell that short account determines the impact. And the most important thing is that you know, you learn who you're telling it for. Katie probably can add to that as well. Yes, I agree. For me, um, especially in the line of organizing, it's all about the stories that we tell. I mean, we can look at the data, we can look at all the other things, but it's the stories that speak to the heart to the heart of issues, to the heart of people. We speak to the mind and to the heart, but it is our stories that we tell that we must tell. And we can use that to help us in our organizing efforts because people want to know we're real people. People join the union, not for the the union, but they join because of people and their stories. And our stories connect us and they change the way our brains interpret everything around us. Can you help me understand that a little better? Sure, taking uh, the principle of connecting. There's a Croatian saying that you can't hurt someone once you know their story. And if you think of a union, you think of a school, they need to know their stories together. As Katie just echoed, it makes us human. It makes us connected. It makes us care. But the brain, we used to think that story and storytelling was just to entertain little kids. That's a beautiful way of doing it, but it also teaches them. And they're slowly realizing that the research supports that our brain is like a city five times over and the neurons light up when you tell a story. But we spend endless amount of time showing people PowerPoints when the brain is wired for story. Lisa Cron mentions this. Jonathan Gottschall says that we're storytelling animals and we are like a literal city. And there has been proven studies both from the brain um, scans and the blood samples that the more powerful your story is, the more connected you are. So let's put those two together. We can create a community that cares and makes a difference and works toward advocacy 
with a proven method that works, and that is storytelling. I think it also builds community. I'm wearing a shirt today that says solidarity is a verb. It's through our actions, right, in our stories. And we hear the relatability of each other because when they can hear our stories, they can begin to relate and see that we are human and see that we are connected. And that's what I love about conversation and about sharing our stories and know that these are real issues with real people with real stories. But one of the things that you brought up was the powerful story. So what makes a story actually powerful? What what engages people and encourages them to take what they're hearing and do something with it? Well, I'll start with a sad note. Kendall Haven, who wrote a book called Story Proof, says that 90 to 95% of stories won't land unless they have two things. And for a union to realize this, for educators to, to realize this, this is the more powerful note. It must have change or resistance to change. And so stories of change is something that we're going to listen to. We don't listen to things in the middle. We listen to things on the edges. We listen to the things about, as Katie pointed out, it makes us human that we're personal, that builds community. So it's we can't just tell the, the an ordinary story. We have to tell a story that has change, and that often includes powerful and passionate difference. And this is important, not just for a local association or, or getting more people to become engaged with the local union, but this has, this has really powerful implications for everyday interactions in your classrooms too. I actually uh, would challenge someone to say that they don't teach with story because story is in almost everything that we do. We spend a lot of time in lesson plan building and objectives, I actually structure my students when I'm teaching them how to be teachers to build story-based lesson plans and kindness-based lesson plans. Why are they, if, if it's the way their brain operates, why don't we plan for that? I call it a narrative mindset. We can, we can take on a narrative mindset. One of my favorite principles started up the day at every meeting and said, let me just tell you what's going on in the school. Let me tell you the stories of the power that's going on. And it could be something that, you know, the football team won, but it could also be a difference that the teacher did. We need to be included. Stories make us visible. And so let's stop with all the data PowerPoints and all that. You can use them, but they need to come from narrative so that we can influence, persuade, and emotionally connect. And this is something you are really sharing with all of the educators you encounter. Uh, just this past weekend, you were talking to the one members and the aspiring educators at a conference. Tell me a little bit about how that session went and what you were really hoping they took away from it. I had the great fortune of working with Katie here at that conference, and we we used story to show why they were visible. Um, and she shared a story, and I might ask her to share a little bit of how that story was powerful when it was told in its complete fashion. Katie, can you share that story or a little bit of it? Sure, not a problem. Um, this was actually a really great opportunity for us to collaborate, to give a motivational minute to aspiring educators um, from all um, from all over the state of Ohio. And so the story, the story that I share was um, a story that happened a few years ago in my local, and it was a powerful story that invoked change, just like we talked about. Um, it was during Black History Month that um, I, I participated amongst the rest of the school, school-wide door decorating contest. And it was for Black History Month. And with that, um, I wanted to go beyond the Harriet, the Martin, and the Malcolm story. And I chose to do the story of the 1963, Children's March of 1963. I'm not sure if you or the listeners are familiar with it, but it is a very interesting story in history that took place. And with that, we wanted to convey that when the adults were afraid to go to the streets, children went and protested. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to empower my students to um, share their voice. And so with that, um, we started on our journey of creating a mural. It was a door decorating contest, but because it's a long hallway, we wanted to tell the story of the, the Children's March of 1963. So on each door, it would bring out all the historical um, events that happened during that time. But there was a problem that happened. Someone took a picture of an incomplete mural um, on the wall in our um, hallway. 
and I posted it on our community um, website. And with that, um, no one ever asked the question. They never made the ask and say, well, explain this. What is this? It's not, you know, complete, but we're interested. No one ever made the ask. In fact, they put it on our website where I was um, told that I was a police hater, a racist, and a lot of different things were said um, about this incomplete mural. And so with that, I tell this story not to um, invoke anger, but to say that it was the ask, the importance of asking the question, making the ask. But out of this, it brought about a significant change in our community, in our school, in our area. And um, with that, um, after we um, decided that this was just a... Um, just a, a, a minor uh, situation that was a miscommunication, um, we were able to come together as a school, as a local, and be able to talk about this issue and come to a resolve where now we are able to have these conversations and we are able to talk about the hard things. And so that story in this moment was so pivotal. It actually put me on a new direction to start talking about um, D DEI, also known as diversity, equity, and inclusion in my area. So it actually changed the way I do things as an educator. It changed perspective. So this was a powerful piece and a powerful moment for my area, for my teachers, for my um, my colleagues, because it really, really did exactly what we just talked about with this, um, the art of storytelling. It allowed us to have a moment to listen so we're talking about the art of listening and what we talked about at the conference. And we also talked about the power of storytelling. So I had an opportunity to sit in a fishbowl-like um, setting where we did a restorative circle with my colleagues. And I was able to tell the story, to take them, walk them through the journey of what happened from the start to the end of how I felt, how my students felt, how you took our voice. And not just mine, but my students' voice because I was asked to to take down the mural effective immediately. And so we just kind of walked through that and we were able to have this conversation. So the big takeaway from this conference, Katie, is that we wanted to be able to talk about the power of storytelling, that what happens when we tell our stories and then what can we do with those stories? How can we use that as an agent of change? How can we use that in the art of organizing and using that as issue organizing for that matter? You know, how can we begin to... Um, to empower people with our stories. So we were really um, excited about motivating and energizing the aspiring educators. And they were, they were so grateful. Um, and then from that, we took um, and went into a, a breakout session. We were able to kind of break that down a little bit more with some people and talk about how we structure um, stories. And we shared a little bit of stories and Dr. Kevin actually kind of walked us through that exercise. But all in all, Katie, it was absolutely amazing. We were super excited. The aspiring educators were excited. People were energized. So <laughs> I was super excited excited about it. And it strikes me because just listening to your story right now, you could say, hi, I'm Katie Fuller and I care about DEI. And that's nice. I, I'm happy for you as an advocate. But when you are able to tell me what happened and, and put that emotion in it, it takes us from the what to the so what and why should I care? And I think that is so very powerful. And I think there's also one element that we haven't really touched on yet. And that's that it's not just what you're saying, it's about what you've been hearing. Listening is such a big part of this. I would only add that um, creating a space for that to happen. So I had the good fortune of being the first full-time high school storytelling teacher in the country. Uh, and one of the, uh, the co-authors that I worked with, or the co-author, um, said both at the middle school and the high school, our students are not being heard. As teachers, we're not being asked for our stories. I had a student, I said, I, want, I was teaching a storytelling class. I said, I want you to go find a student that, or a teacher that has asked for your story. She came back two weeks later. She was an honor student. Maggie said, I either don't understand the assignment or I can't. No one's asked my opinion, let alone my story. And so we wrote a book called Raising Voices, Creating Youth Storytelling Groups and Troops. Here's the deal. If we don't make space for students to be heard, if we don't make space for educators to be heard, and these are divergent stories, these are different stories. Story wakes up the world. It creates an understanding for differences, but teachers and, and administrators sometimes are never asked, what is your story? Or as Katie say, why? why? What is your story of why of being the educator? We're borrowing from Simon Sinek. It is so important 
that we, I mean, I'm biased and intentionally. We should change our curriculum and the way that we act to answer to the stories that we want to tell individually, collectively, and for the school itself. Do you think everyone has a powerful story to tell? There's no question to that. I mean, there is because you ask it, but <laughs> <laughs> everyone has a powerful story. But it's like um, I, I, I met a 45-year-old woman who came up to me and said, "Is it?" she said, I never heard stories growing up. Is it okay that I want them now? I was aghast to, to think that this woman had to ask my permission that it was okay to tell stories. But stories are in our blood. It's who we are. It's how we think. It's how we react. It's how we receive. Um, we need to answer the story instead of ignoring it because it is the way that we talk and make, make meaning and, and decide on ideas. The research is supporting it. And if we want to promote change, let's listen to each other. We don't always have to tell. Um, most of telling is listening. That's how you become a better storyteller and story maker. Educators need not be silent in the room, but they need to be silent when they come in so they can hear what others are thinking so that collectively co-creation can occur. And at the end of the day, is unionism our co-creation of our story together? I would say indeed. Um, in 1979, in Ohio, in Brunswick, 100 teachers were put in jail for unionizing. It was international news. I taught at that school. And the first person who was my landlord, who was also a teacher there, said, I need to tell you about the union. I know you know it from a pamphlet. I want to tell you what it is. I want to tell you the story of it. I want to tell you, I want you to meet the person that was put in jail by this judge in a rotating cycle and this story is real, and this story could happen again. I want to. I want you to tell you why uh, you're not charged. I mean, why you have breaks in your day. I want. I want to tell you why there's a contract. It. It was so so important, and the story is how we make it real. Seeing a slide isn't going to do that. Listening to the people is going to empower. Katie has a lot to say to that too. Absolutely. I would say that, say that continue to tell your stories. We all have a story inside of our book. And I would just encourage as we teach, reach, and inspire people to action, we can do that with the stories that we tell. So lead, 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 lead on with your stories and your voice because we all have a powerful voice. Use your voice, tell your story. And remember, you have a why. And I would only add that your stories are important. The person that's telling the story is very important. We need to nurture the craft that we're listening deeper. We live in a world which can be full of indecision and even anger. And one way we become less angry is truly listening to each other. We don't have to agree, but we should move inside the story so that we can see it differently. And we can be advocates for what we understand and learn what we don't. Educators have the best job in the world. I tell people they should be, other people should be jealous because people have chosen to teach. It's been my practice. Has there been hard moments within the context of that story? Yes, but teaching is the most valuable thing that we can do. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share my story in hopes of hearing everybody else's. Kevin Cordy, Katie Fuller, thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you. As you heard there, everyone has a story to tell. And our next guest has such a powerful story. Overcoming so many challenges as a single mom of three, going to school to get her degree, leaning into her incredible thirst for knowledge to continue seizing every learning opportunity that came her way throughout her career, and never losing sight of her driving motivation in all that she does, simply wanting help people. And that's what Sandy Smith Fisher wants to do on the State Teachers Retirement System Board. She wants to help. She's running to represent active teachers on the STRS Board to work collaboratively with all stakeholders to help ensure all teachers, now and into the future, can rely on a good pension they won't outlive. The OEA Board of Directors believes in Sandy Smith Fisher and voted to endorse her in this election. 
Take a listen to our conversation with Sandy Smith-Fisher about what she would bring to the STRS board. Sandy Smith-Fisher, thank you so much for sitting down with us to help us understand who you are and what you will bring to the STRS board uh, as you run to represent the active educators in our state. Why do you want to be on the STRS board? I'm the type of person that likes to help others, and I try to help out whenever possible. And I was at two rep assemblies, and both times, you know, they were asking for somebody to stand up and to be on the board because there was an open available seat. Um, So because somebody asked for help, I stood up and decided to try to help. So I'm going to do whatever I can to help the active and the retired because I think all of us together, that's, that is what the STRS is. You know, it's, it's the retirement and we need to think about everybody. And not just the current retirees and the current actives, but also making sure that it's a, a sustainable system for future educators. Oh, absolutely. Is, is that something yes. you're hearing as you're, as you're talking to people during this election season? Well, yes, I do talk to a lot of people and, you know, people are worried about, you know, when they retire, is there going to be enough money? Um, Are they going to be having a COLA? And even the people who are already retired, you know, is it going to be sustainable? You know, are they going to have a COLA back? And, you know, is it going to be what was promised to us, you know, so many years ago? Um, All I can say is that when I'm elected, then I'll be able to be there to be part of those conversations, to help everybody work through. You know, there's a lot of people that are already on the board who have been on the board in the past, you know, and their voices are just as important as mine. I'm trying to bring the voices of everybody who cannot be there so that we're making sure that we're taking care of everybody. Making sure that is a stable, reliable pension for everybody uh, I I know that you are working uh, or would be working to restore benefits like the COLA and the uh, eligibility age as much as possible, but it has to be done responsibly. Um, Absolutely. Going into this, how do you balance those priorities? Well, you have to make sure that the money that we have there is safe and it's not being spent on things that don't need to be like like I know across districts you know I hear a lot of times you know because I'm also you know a member of a UNICEF and I'm the secretary there so I hear from you know a lot of people there too you know how oh you know our district's top heavy you know and oh they're spending money on things that they shouldn't be well being able to look at that kind of stuff you know at the STRS board you know, where you can see, oh, okay, well, this is happening. Maybe we don't need to do that so that we can prepare better for the future for the members, you know, because isn't that what the retirement's supposed to be for? It's for the members for their future. And and the questions that you would bring to the board are the questions that I think a lot of people are asking. Um, And it's the questions you're hearing from people all around you. Yeah. Well, Sandy, I know that you have uh, twice served as the president of your local association, uh, currently a building representative. And as you mentioned, you're the secretary of your leadership council. Talk to me a little bit about how we got to this point in your career and in your life. Well, um, for many years, I was a single mom with three children and I you know, went back to work after my last one was about two or three years old. And I was a Head Start, you know, teacher. I worked there and I had to go and get my educational specialist degree or something. I can't remember. It was uh, an associate's degree. That's what it was. It was the associate's. So while I was going to all of those classes after, you know, going to work every day, um, I would go to Kent State and take classes and I would bring my children to the evening classes with me. And then I was also a Cub Scout leader and a Girl Scout leader all at the same time. Um, And my daughter, my oldest one, she had some hard time with her writing and stuff. So she would transcribe all of her homework into a tape replayer. And then I would type it out every night too, as well as doing all of my homework 
and taking care of the children. And then um, after I graduated the first time, they asked me to stay on to get my master's. So I did. And that's why, you know, it wasn't until 2001 that I started teaching. Um, I didn't marry my husband until 2008. And then he deployed. And that was, was it the first year that I was? Yes, I think that was the first time I was the president when he was deployed. Um, so that was that was a little bit challenging. You know, even though I was married, it was kind of like, here I am again, <laughs> you know, doing everything, you know. But again, it's it's all about helping others. I have to make sure that I know as much as I can to be the best person available to be able to help others and to bring a voice, you know, forward to those that don't stand up or cannot have their voice heard. You know, so that's what I try to do. That's why I'm an intervention specialist because our students, they don't always have a voice. So I try to stick up for them, you know, because they can't. It's the same thing with the members, you know, in your local unions. You know, there's a lot of people who don't want to be involved, as they say, but they still have a voice that needs to be heard. Again, the same thing when you start getting bigger, you know, with the NEOEA and even with the OEA. People have voices that want to be shared, but they do not stand up for whatever their personal reason is. And that is fine. I am willing to bring their voices forward because that's just the kind of person I am. And I know as an intervention specialist, you have uh, really developed a reputation for collaboration uh, with parents, with administrators, teachers, other education professionals, uh, making sort of a supportive network around each student. The power of teamwork is is a really big thing for you. How do you bring that from the classroom setting to the STRS board when you're elected? Well, you have to value others to begin with. And, and you have to listen to what their concerns are and what their ideas are. And then after you have all of that, then you kind of meld each person's together to find commonalities and you build off of that. It's not you don't want to roll over anybody. You want everybody to have value. So if you're going to be part of a team, that means listening to things that you might not want to hear or making decisions that you might not like. But there was um, some trainings that I've gone through where they talk about having 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent that you're OK with because you're not always going to get your way 100 percent of the time. But if you can be 75 to 80 percent OK with that and move on, that's something to build on. And you got to find that within each person within the team. There's got to be a little bit of give and take. Without it, there's nothing but fighting. And that's not good. And certainly not when it comes to the STRS board, where everyone really needs to be working together to make sure that we have the most um, stable sustainable pension for all retirees moving forward. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you have to have the ability to communicate and be open and have that open communication with each other so that you can hear what they're saying. You can work together to make sure that the retirement is stable, that it you know, it is going to be sustainable and that you're not being frivolous with things. You, know, you have to look at all parts and say, what what can we do to make this better? You know, what what do we see as an area that needs to be improved upon? Because everything needs to be improved upon at some point. You know, we're not all perfect. You know, so just listening to others and working through it and finding that common ground to build on. Well, Sandy Smith Fisher, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Good luck in your campaign. Why, thank you, Katie. It was really nice to meet with you and to have this little bit of time together um, so that we could answer some of the questions some people have been having. Remember, in this STRS election, all votes must be received by May 6th at 4.30 p.m. 
Active teachers should have received a ballot in the mail with an invitation to vote by mail, phone, or online. If you have not received your ballot or if you lost it, contact the Election Services Help Desk right away. There's an email address and phone number in the show notes for this episode, along with a link to learn more about Sandy Smith Fisher. Until next time, stay well. And remember, in Ohio, public education matters.